Hello and welcome to Dialogue. The 15th BRICS Summit has kicked off in Johannesburg, South Africa, amidst the geopolitical uncertainties and increasing pressure on the global economy. The five-country grouping of Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa has emerged as a robust and comprehensive group with dozens more nations looking to join. What is topping the agenda of this year's summit? How do BRICS countries feel about potential expansion? And what challenges face the group and how are they cooperating to meet those challenges? To take a closer look at these issues, I'm glad to be joined by Charles Liu, founder of Hall Capital and senior fellow at the Taihe Institute, Artu Anija, editor of the Indian Narrative, and Charles Tan, chairman of the Brazil-China Chamber of Commerce and Industry. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qinduo. Welcome to Dialogue. Uh, well, we have two Charles's. Charles Liu, I will start with you. Uh, let's first deal with, you know, the, there's a, you know, a growing intention globally on the current summit. Uh, one of the, uh, you know, puzzles or questions surrounding the summit is really about the nature of the, of the uh, grouping, you know, or what's the purpose, what's the goal of these five emerging large economies. Uh, and the leaders have, uh, you know, made efforts to diffuse uh, some of the concerns or speculation. Uh, for example, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping said, BRICS is, a quote, is not an exercise of taking sides not of creating block confrontation. And uh, President uh, of uh, Brazil, Lula, said, we do not want to be a counterpoint to the G7, G20, or the United States. We just want to organize ourselves. Uh, so Charles Liu, I will start with you. you know, what's the purpose? What is the goal, exact goal of this grouping of developing nations? I think this has changed over the time. It first was raised by Jim O'Neill, 2001, of Goldman Sachs, about countries with great potential, economic potential, and probabilities of making investment in these countries and make returns. So it, that's how it all began. And then the heads of state of the first four BRIC countries met a few years later and decided to form an organization I think the forming of the organization was more these four countries find it productive to have annual sessions, not only at the summit level, but also at ministerial levels to include more collaboration amongst them. So it was really for economic development, for collaboration, for joint addressing of global issues and global problems. But all of that has become even more significant because more and more developing countries of the global south are finding they have some common issues that they have to deal with. And the common issues involves, of course, development issues, involves climate change, involves how to regional, the regionalization and the regional collaboration which has been formed. So I think it's now just another format of developing nations or emerging nations trying to spend more time together and discuss issues and see how to be more inclusive, how to be more positive and to have greater growth for its people. Mm -hmm. uh, Charles Town in Brazil, so it's really about uh, unleashing their potential, economic potential and also cooperation, uh, but at the same time, uh, their purpose or their role uh, around the world is evolving as the time changes? Well, of course, for Brazil, President Lula is very close to China. And President Lula uh, is changing the isolation of Brazil under the last president and reconnecting to the world. Now, BRICS is very important also, aside from everything that Charles Liu said, you know, since the Second World War, the global order has been dominated and the global financial system, founded in Brenton Woods in 1944, has been dominated by the Western countries. And these developed countries do not always understand the needs of the emerging nations. 
So, the, you know, why, why does the president of the World Bank always have to be in America? Why does the president of the IMF always have to be a European? And the Asian Development Bank is Japanese. You know, the, today the global financial system is controlled by the, except for Germany, the largest debtor nations. And the largest creditor nations, like the BRICS nations, don't have much of a say in the global financial system. And that is why the new development bank was created and the Asian investment infrastructure investment bank was created. But I think it's also a grouping of emerging nations that understand each other and their own needs much better than the dominating rich nations, so-called rich nations, who are the largest debtor nations in the world. Uh, yes, uh, that's a you know, good summary about uh, the, uh, you know, what bring those countries together. And R2, you know, uh, uh, Prime Minister of uh, India, Modi, said, you know, we value that BRICS has become a platform for discussing and deliberating on issues of concern for the entire global south, including development imperatives and reform of the multilateral system. Reform of the multilateral system, so a more just and fairer multilateral system? Yeah, I oh, think yes, that's... Yeah, uh, yeah Atu, please. Yeah, yeah definitely, Ching Do, that uh, there, is a, there is a need to reform the international system, uh, which would mean uh, uh, the reform of the UN Security Council, for example, and inclusion of uh, uh, emerging countries like India, Brazil, South Africa, which represent the realities of today's world and not of the world uh, of 1945. So yes, that's that's one change which needs to be done. G20 has to change because uh, you have African Union, for example, going to be there this time uh, when we have uh, the G20 summit next month in New Delhi uh, as one of the key members. The, the bigger point is that it, the, the world has become multipolar. There are new power centers which have emerged, uh, both in terms of political power and more so the geoeconomic power, which need platforms, which need... Uh, which need to voice uh, their concerns on, 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 on the global scale. And that's where organizations such as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the BRICS come into play. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, there are regional groupings like African Union, etc. But the world needs reform and the multilateral institutions created in, the in 1945 simply do not, are not representative enough to meet their needs and aspirations of a new world, a new multipolar world, which is there Chindo, in front of our eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two, of course, you know, to, better, to better understand this, uh, uh, this grouping, of course, you know, there are, uh, I would say, uh, a variety of uh, uh, like, you know, speculation or understanding or misunderstanding of this uh, grouping. For example, people would say, oh, the relationship with G7 uh, is, uh, uh, you know, breaks uh, the counterpart or the counterpoint of G7. Uh, Atu, how do you see its relationship with the G7, a group of uh, Western nations? Yes, I mean, the G7 is again, uh, I think, uh, is, it reflects a time frame which is long gone. I mean, G7 was relevant and you had the Japan coming in uh, in between, but that is post-45 world order, the world dominated by, by, the, by the West. But we, uh, Chengdu, are seeing a post-West uh, era emerging in front of us. Uh, by saying post-West, I'm not saying anti-West, but it is a post-West era where the new players which have come in. So I think uh, there is going to be new groupings naturally which are going to come. And uh, I think they should, they should establish the peaceful transition of the global system by establishing a very vibrant dialogue with the G7. Uh, and I hope that's the way forward. But otherwise, uh, I think uh, G7 is a bit outdated to reflect the current economic realities of the world, leave alone the political realities. So there can be a points of friction, but that's where the wisdom lies of how do we evolve into a new world order, a new system without it necessarily going confrontationist. You have to have a multipolar world where the West has to accept that there are new players now with whom you have to relate, you have to cooperate. And that's the only way that a smooth global transition can take place. 
If that doesn't happen, then we are in for clashes, etc. Because I think uh, the global south and the emerging economies have had enough of Western domination. And uh, the sentiment is strong now that they have a level playing field where they have their voice along with theirs to shape uh, shape the world. That's that's the ideal scenario, Chingdu. But I hope it works that way. And we, got, we need to work on that, that track and work hard on that. But at the same time, if it doesn't happen, then I think we are in a big we are in big trouble. Uh, we see the conflicts which are already emerging. You see Ukraine, Russia is is going on in front of our eyes. There could be, you know, hopefully uh, we can avoid that kind of situation uh, because if we don't accommodate and adjust and see the new realities, then I think uh, we are in trouble. I think this whole attitude of entitlement of the West that they are the, to run the world and the rest of, are to follow, that they define the rules and others are not accommodated. I think that era is long gone. That's the objective reality. Mm-hmm. Now the question is whether you actually accept it and put it into policy frameworks. And this is where we are uh, in, in, a, in a stage actually of great tension and, and potential conflict with the, op, with the possibility of cooperation as well. Yeah, possibility. It's a, it's a big transition which is going on. Yeah, a big transition. Uh, Charles Tang, you know, we see uh, you know, what's happening on the ground that you know, more than 30 African heads of state are invited to attend the summit. Uh, and obviously, you know, some other uh, developing nations like Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, Argentina, uh, they are lobbying to join the club of uh, nations here. Uh, so what does it say about this group? You know, within this group, countries are already very different from each other, different political system, different values, different uh, state of development there. I think that they all share one common thought. You know, post Second World War, all these nations that we mentioned were very poor. And the Western nations dominated the whole international world order. Now, like our Indian colleague said, many of these poor nations have become very strong and wealthy nations. And they all want to have a say also in the global order and not just follow the world order, established world order of today. And they understand, I think a grouping like BRICS, I participated many years ago when China wanted to create the BRICS plus five or, or, or enlarge the BRICS group. Today, of course, we have 40 something nations, half of which already registered to join and the other half wanting interesting, expressing interest to join the BRICS. And I think basically it can become a very, very significant grouping to understand better what the developing nation wants rather than have the uh, rich nations world order imposed upon the developing nations. Uh, but, but Charles Town, you know, of course, you know, a follow-up question here is really about uh, larger developing nations. Maybe uh, it will be expanded to include more developing nations like Indonesia, Saudi Arabia. In what way they will say interact or relate to the G7, you know, Western nations, rich nations here? I think, like uh, you know, Chairman Xi Jinping said, it's not to confront anybody. It's just to develop its own interests. Okay, uh, and, you know, I don't think we must we can look at, you know, the BRICS versus G7. I think everybody should interact together and it's not a, you know, a, a, a battle cry. It's just let's get together the developing nations, mm-hmm. which makes up more than, you know, a, a large percentage of the world GDP and more than half of the world population once the BRICS become expanded today. It's already almost 30% of the GDP and almost half of the population of the world as it stands today. So with these new additions, it will be overwhelming. Yeah, uh, Ch- Charles Liu, uh, obviously, uh, you know, as we are discussing here, uh, it is very different from G- G7 nations in, you know, in, in probably other aspects too, uh, for example. Uh, the principles they follow that like, you know all the developing nations you know they say they respect sovereignty territorial integrity they don't interfere in the internal affairs of other of each other of other emerging uh, markets or countries uh, 
and uh, they are open and they have different systems, but they are cooperating with, with each other without uh, barriers. Uh, very different from the practice uh, of the, usually uh, Western nations. And also, they, you know, most of them, or basically all of them, I would say, in a sense, they are taking a neutral stance in terms of the Ukraine conflict, for example. That's something very, uh, I would say, uh, standing out from the existing uh, Western organizations. Absolutely. The Western side, in terms of the Ukraine and Russia conflict, have been putting everything onto so what is politically correct and criticizing developing countries for taking a neutral stand. Developing countries are interested in development, in collaborative development, in improving the lives of its people, accelerating their economic development. They're not interested in taking sides. What I see with BRICS, and as mentioned before, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, New Development Bank, Asian Infrastructure Development Bank, Investment Bank. With all of this, it's all aimed at one simple objective, not domination, but inclusiveness, but also collaboration among developing countries. Take, for example, the Belt and Road of China, right? A hundred some countries joined the Belt and Road Initiative of China. And do, they, do you see conflict between them on the political side? No, it's all about collaboration. It's all about improving infrastructure of countries, building railroads, building ports, building airports, and so on and so forth. So I think with an expanded BRICS, and the more expanded, the better actually, they speak with a louder voice. They give better consideration of what the needs of the developing countries are, the global south, and they can share experiences in how to deal with what had been an unfair system that has existed for the last 40, 60 years. Mm -hmm. Well, Charles, you talked about expansion of this grouping. Uh, of course, we are seeing uh, probably front runners, uh, you know, of uh, of candidates. Uh, we mentioned about Indonesia. This is also mentioned by President Lula. You know, he talked about uh, Argentina's membership, and he mentioned Indonesia. And uh, there are guesses of like uh, Indonesia, and Saudi Arabia probably will be accepted as uh, the first uh, group of countries. Uh, and then people, of course, uh, not exactly agreeing with each other on like. Uh, should we expand now or on what conditions we should expand? You know, what kind of criteria we should follow? Uh, what do you make of that? I think it's important not only to consider what the original founding members' thoughts are, we should also consider very much what the new applicants or those who want to join, why do they want to join? I think it's very clear why do they want to join. They want to be in a grouping that gives them more clout, more say, more influence on a global basis, especially against further hegemony from US and some of the Western European countries. So it's, it's actually good to, ha to have an expansion, but the expansion, not only the five current members have to consider their own interests, but also have to consider the interests of the others, those who want to join. And it's all in the positive sense inclusive sense that this is taking place. I think a lot of what the press coverage about how, oh, India doesn't like this, or Brazil doesn't like that. I think a lot of that is probably bad propaganda. I don't think it's, it's, uh, it's legitimate position of governments because for the Indian government, for the Brazilian government, for the Chinese government, the Russian government, South African government, it is always good to have a bigger team on your side and a team of countries which have similar interests, similar uh, consideration, similar views. It's always good to have that. Mm -hmm. Well, President Lula has made it clear that, you know, he is a full expansion. Uh, uh, two, uh, so, uh, I mean, larger, the better, but of course, there's a, there's a limit, you know, people, uh, you know, think of this uh, as a potential, uh, I mean, efficiency issue, but still, you know, if you have a louder voice, probably uh, you are better heard about your interests, uh, or, you know, protect the interests of the developing nations. 
Yes, uh, I mean, uh, uh, personally, I, I'm totally for expansion, but even from an official point of view, uh, the Indian government's position has been stated by the spokesperson of the Ministry of External Affairs saying that this is a false propaganda going that India opposes expansion. That's not the case. Only thing one is asking for is what is the criteria, who should come into the, into, into the tent. Uh, we need to deliberate that within ourselves, that is the five countries before we open the door uh, for for entry of uh, other countries. But frankly, if you take countries like, let's say, Saudi Arabia coming in or even Iran coming in, it, it changes the entire world energy order, uh, to be honest. Uh, it's going to be a huge thing for the BRICS and for the world if something like that happens. Or uh, Indonesia. I mean, look at it. It's right at the mouth of the Strait of Malacca. And uh, a pivotal state, uh, if you look at it, just the geographical location, along with its economic potential. So I think we need to get those kind of countries which will contribute to, to, to the emerging economies. How much money can they, let's say, put it very, very, very crudely into the new development bank? How much of funding can we increase by when we get these new members? I think these are the kind of uh, conversations we need to have internally. But I think uh, my own view is that we should have it fast. And um, at least the first batch uh, which are, which, which, on which a consensus can be reached should come in. Uh, I can see from India's point of view, there's no way we can oppose, let's say, a Saudi Arabia coming in. We have special strategic ties with them. They're central to our energy security. I don't think we'll do anything to displease them, frankly, or, or, or Indonesia. Uh, so uh, let's, let's hope that we can get an early harvest of expansion and then take a pause. And, and think about uh, in detail at all the pros and cons. Uh, Chindu, if you recall, you know, look at the non-line movement. It moved to G77. Mm-hmm. I mean, we got this huge developing countries coming in, but frankly, it was it didn't work so well. But the world has changed. The time has changed. The G77 did not have powerful economies as the BRICS has, so it's not entirely entirely a parallel sort of a example. But the but the bigger point is, go ahead, go ahead with with resolve. Uh, and not and with an open mind, but do think about it after you have done your first phase of expansion and how do you, whether it's really going to help uh, the the BRICS emerging economies and the global south. Mm-hmm. Uh, Charles Tom, of course, you know part of the motivation or you know for for potential can, for the potential members, of course, is about uh, you know interests and benefits. Uh, and one of the concerns may be also uh, the use of uh, the, the currency issue, for example, you know, uh, because of, uh, frankly speaking, the abuse of the dominant position of the U.S. dollar. You know, many countries are concerned uh, uh, with this uh, over-reliance of uh, the U.S. dollar in the global financial system. Uh, so uh, President Lula has called for a common currency. And, uh, you know, uh, President Putin has said that, uh, you know, the reduce of the reliance of U.S. dollar is uh, the trend is irreversible. And uh, how do you see that? Well, in every opportunity, President Lula always is always in every gathering is always saying that the developing nations or the Mercosur, for example, he's now the president, rotating president of the Mercosur, the four nations a free trade zone in South America. He wants to use a common currency and rather than depend on the dollar, the US dollar. And for trade between nations, for example, now Brazil has signed an agreement with China to use the, their local currencies. So why should the traders or investors have to go through the trouble of changing their money into dollars, have the risk of the exchange, and then you know, having to change it back to their own currencies. So I think that it makes a lot of sense. Of course, it's going to be very difficult because, you know, different countries have different economic mights. And to have a common currency among weak na- economically weak nations and economically strong nations is a delicate matter. But it makes sense not to have everybody bear the cost of changing their currencies into U.S. dollars, suffering the exchange risks, and then changing it back. So trade and uh, financing between Brazil and China now can be done in yuan or in Brazilian real. Okay, and I think President Lula is very correct in wanting a currency, common currency, and uh, you know because uh, depending on the dollar has many 
financial and political risks. Okay, so I think that this is one common uh, interest of all the countries, and the other, and many of the countries want to gather together because individually they don't have such a big voice, but mm -hmm. together defending the interests of the developing nations, of which the rich nations don't always understand the needs of the developed nations is, I think, one of the main attractions as well. Yeah, uh, Charles Liu, you know, uh, following what uh, Charles Tan has said that, uh, you know, of course, you know, besides this, uh, uh, you know, the risk associated with uh, like a uh, dollar uh, uh, denominated assets, um, and there's also a risk of like the fluctuation of the value of the US dollar, for example, you know, 20 year high now, and that has hurt the economic output of the developing world. For example, it's becoming more difficult for them to pay the debt in dollar. Absolutely. This has been done by the US a number of times. Every time when they needed it, they would raise the interest rates and push the dollar higher and make developing countries pay more in their own currencies for debt repayment. These are all issues of dollar hegemony I think we, we can only start somewhere, and that, that is to start with local currency trade settlement. Um, it's, a, it's going to be, to be a long and possibly quite painful process because the dollar is so deeply entrenched in the global trading system, in the global financial system, that it's going to take some time. I don't think there will be serious discussion of a common currency among the BRIC nations this, at this summit. There could be discussions of further enhancement of trade settlement in local currencies, free trade zones, better uh, regulatory schemes on the trade side. But I don't think there will be a serious discussion on the new currency, mm -hmm. at least not for now. Not for now. Uh, everybody understands that too. You know, it's, uh, it's no easy task at all you know, to have a common currency. Uh, not to mention replacing the U.S. dollar, uh, but still, you know, if you recall, you know, uh, the the currency that's our currency, but your problem, uh, that kind of attitudes, <laughs> and uh, there's uh, every reason for large developing nations to at least reduce the reliance on the U.S. dollar, a so-called de-dollarization, right? Right, and that's Until already please. beginning to take place. Yeah, 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 absolutely, Jingdo. I completely agree with Charles on that. That you know, the, there's a natural process of de-dollarization which is taking place. I don't think we can push it too hard, but you know, bilateral currencies exchange. I think that's going on already. Russia is selling us oil right now, and we are paying them in rupees or in UAE dirhams, depending on how we do it, but not in not in US dollars. So that's already happening. You're paying in each other's uh, currencies or finding a third route out of it. Uh, now I agree that you know we the entire de-dollarization. Uh, it's going to take time. But there's a natural evolution of economy which is taking place. And I think we'll ride with that. Mm -hmm. And sooner or later, we're going to have a more, you know, the dollar hegemony. I mean, his writing is on the wall that it's going to end. The question yes. is not whether, but when. Yeah, well, uh, it has already started. That's, uh, uh, you know, what is important. <laughs> well, with that, we come to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGT app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.